right. So we're going to take a look um, at chapter four. We'll do chapter four this academic week and next academic week. And chapter four is on what we call rational functions. It's all about rational functions. So first thing we have to remember, though, uh, from chapter three is what a polynomial is. Okay. Because rational functions are going to be made up of polynomials. So if we don't understand that, then this won't make sense either. So remember, a polynomial, just a quick review of that. So polynomials, um, they do not have negative exponents on variables. Um, and they don't have decimals. Not have decimals on variables. So no negative exponents, no variables, and all coefficients. That means all the numbers in front of the variables, not the exponent. The number in front of the variable uh, are real. So let me show you some examples of things that are polynomials and things that are not. Something that is a polynomial, something like x cubed minus 2x squared plus 3x minus 1. That's a polynomial. It doesn't have any negative exponents on the variables. It doesn't have any decimal on the variable, uh, decimal exponents. And it doesn't have any numbers in front of the variables that are imaginary. Okay, they're all real. Here's another one. It's missing some terms. It doesn't have an x squared term. It doesn't have an x term. It just jumped from x cubed all the way down to the number without x. But that's fine. Again, no negative exponents on the variables. Uh, they don't have decimal exponents on the variables. And there's no numbers in front that are um, imaginary. Okay, let's do something like this. Uh, let's 3x to the fourth minus 5 to the negative second power. That's perfectly fine. When we talk about not having any negative exponents, it's negative exponents on the variable. A negative exponent on a number, that's fine. If you don't remember from, from like Algebra 1, a negative exponent on a number just means that that number goes into the bottom of a fraction. That's 5 to the negative 2. It means 1 over 5 to the 2. And what is 5 to the second power? Yeah, so 5 to the negative 2 really just means 1 25th. It's a fraction. It's a decimal. And if you think, well, wait, I thought you said decimals weren't OK. Decimals on the exponents. That's not an exponent. That's just the number that's at the end. It's the same as this. 1 over 25 is not an exponent. <coughs> So those are all things that are polynomials. Okay, things that are not would be something like this. Um, let's say x to the negative third minus 6. What makes that one not a polynomial? A negative exponent. Yeah, you've got a negative exponent. That's no good. All right, so let's say we had x to the 4.3 minus x squared minus 5. Okay, what makes that one not a polynomial? A decimal. Yeah, you have a decimal on the exponent. Okay, you can't have that. Um, how about, let's get rid of the decimal. 2i x squared minus 3x plus 7. What makes that not a polynomial? Right, you've got a coefficient that's imaginary. 2i is imaginary. Okay, so those are all examples of things that are not exponents. Um, something else are not polynomials. This. You might say, oh, wait, that doesn't have any imaginaries. It doesn't have any decimal exponents, or it doesn't look like it does. It doesn't have any negative exponents 
But when you write a square root, let me show you something on the, um, on the calculator. If I do the square root of 16, what will I get? Yeah, I get 4. Now take 16 and raise it to the 1 half power. You get the same thing. Raising something to the 1 half power means to take a square root. So technically, you could rewrite this as x to the 1 half. Those are the exact same thing. Now you have a decimal exponent. That's not a polynomial. So that one can be a little tricky because it's almost like the exponent is a decimal, but it's hidden in the square root symbol. Okay. So any question on what is and what isn't a polynomial? Okay, I'll give you one more that isn't. That's not a polynomial either. Because I have an exponent in the bottom of a fraction on a variable. When you have an exponent that's in the bottom of a fraction, what kind of exponent is that really? It's really like a negative exponent. Right? Like when you have 5 to the negative 2, we had to put it in the bottom and it became 5 to the second. So that is exactly the same thing as that. Those are the same thing. That's a negative exponent because it's in the bottom of a fraction and it's on a variable. Okay, so again, a little hidden there, but it's still the same, same, one of the same rules I told you earlier. Okay, so now what, what is a rational function? So a rational function is basically when you take a polynomial and you divide it by another polynomial. It's a fraction of polynomials. That's a rational function. I'm just calling the top one uh, polynomial P and the bottom one polynomial Q. So the top is a polynomial and the bottom is a polynomial. And together, that's called a rational function. The only thing you can't put in the bottom of a fraction is 0, because then we'd be dividing by 0. Um, so we still can't. We can never do that. Okay. But other than that, you could put anything else in the bottom that is a polynomial. Okay. Let's look at an example. Is the top a polynomial, x squared plus 1? Yeah, no negative exponents, no decimal exponents on the variable, and no imaginary numbers in front of the x. Yep, that's a, that's a polynomial. That's a quadratic polynomial because it's a degree. It's to the second power. How about the bottom? x minus 3. Is that a polynomial? Yeah, that's a linear polynomial. It's like y equals mx plus b. Right? It's x to the first power. So that's a polynomial on the top. That's a polynomial on the bottom. So together, when you divide them, you get a rational function. That's a rational function right there. Let's look at this one. Um, 3x squared <coughs> minus 4x plus 1. Um, is that a polynomial? Yeah. Yep, that's a, that's a quadratic. There's Something on the bottom there. Is that a polynomial? Yeah. Oops, Sam, you said no. How come? Because there's a, it's in the denominator and there's an exponent on the variable. Um, so when we're looking at it, just look at this separate and say, OK, is that, pretend like nothing else exists outside that red box. OK, is that a polynomial? And then look at this separate. Is that, if you ignore that it's in the bottom of a fraction, is that a polynomial? Yeah. So what you'd want to, what you wouldn't want to see in the bottom is something like this. If you had that, that would not be a polynomial because now the x squared is in the bottom of the fraction. Does that make sense? Okay. When it's just in that red box like that, it's it's okay. Just look at the top and say, is it a polynomial? Look at the bottom and say, is that a polynomial? If it is, then that's a rational function. Just make sure that in the red box, you don't have something in the bottom of a fraction. Okay. Uh, 
right, so now we're going to talk about what the domain is of a rational function. So remember, the domain are all the numbers that you are allowed to plug in. What's the only thing that you're not allowed to do with a fraction? We have to make sure that what never happens. Yeah? Right, we just have to make sure that we don't ever divide by zero. So let's just look at one of, one of these. Let's look at this one right here, okay, the one that I just circled. Is there a number that if I fill it into the bottom, it would cause me to divide by zero? Yeah. Three. Yep. So we would say that the domain for this problem is every number except three. Okay. I'm going to show you how we write that in a second. But that would be the domain, every number except three. So the domain is all real numbers except any number that would cause you to divide by zero. Oh, oh that's pretty, actually, I think that's the one I just, we just did together. What did we just say the number is that you can't plug in um, for x in the bottom? Three. Okay, so think of that as, as being like on a number line. You can't plug in three. Could you plug in something lower than three? Yep, you could plug in something lower than three. So we have to describe that, we'll call that section one. Could you plug in anything higher than three? Yep, so let's call that section two. So now just describe the numbers in section one and section two. Tell me how low and high they go. How low do the numbers in section one go? Negative infinity. And since we can't reach that, what kind of symbol do we put on that? Yep. Parentheses. Parentheses. And how high do the numbers in section one go? No, section one stops before that. It stops at three. Can we include the three? No. So that describes all the numbers in section one. Anything that is below three. Or, now in section two, how low do the numbers go? They go as low as three, including or not including it? Not including it. And then how high do the numbers go? Infinity. When you have to write down a domain, and there is only one number that doesn't work, that's the pattern you will always see. The only thing that will change is what I just circled in green. And what is in green is the number that doesn't work. But everything else stays exactly the same. Okay. Any questions on that? All right, let's try, um, let's, I'm going to come back to B. Let's do C first. So don't get confused by what's in the top. You, if you guys want to call this one B, you can't be confused. Keep it in order in your notes. The top doesn't, doesn't really matter. It's just the bottom. Is there a number that I could plug in that would make the bottom come out to zero? Two. two. Yeah, if I plug in two, I get two minus two is zero. And if I plug it in over here, what's two plus four? Six. Six, and zero times six? Zero. zero. So two is a number that makes the bottom um, zero. So I'm just gonna put that off to the side. Can't use two. Is there anything else that we can't plug in? Negative. Now we also can't use negative four. So that's what you can't use. Now we wanna write down uh, what you can use. So again, think of it as like a, as like a picture. You can't use that number, and you can't use that number. So this time, how many sections do you think we're going to have to describe? We're going to have to describe three. The numbers here, the numbers there, and then the numbers there. Okay. So let's start, start with section one. Um, how low do the numbers in section one go? Negative. Yep, they go all the way to negative infinity. And they go up to, but not including, negative 4. Or, now we write the next section, um, how low do the numbers go in section 2? Negative 4. Negative 4. 
not including negative 4. And they go up to 2, two but not including 2. Or how low do the numbers in section 3 go? 2, not including it. And how high do they go? Infinity. When you have a domain that has two numbers you need to exclude, that's what the pattern always looks like. The only thing that's going to change, those are the two lower numbers you need to exclude. And these are the two higher numbers. But those are the only, just the two things I circled in green and red are what change. So if you had to exclude like negative 5 and 7, just change what's in green to a negative 5, change what's in red to a 7. But that's what it will always look like. Yes? Um, how many like, sections will we see? Um, that would be the most. I would say either two sections, like we did in this one, mm -hmm. or three sections. When you have to exclude one number, you get two sections. When you have to exclude two numbers, you get three sections. Kind of like if you took a piece of string and you cut it once, you get two pieces. If you take a piece of string and you cut it twice, you get three pieces. So you get one more. Yeah. Okay. Now let's try this one. This one is similar to example B. But the bottom is written a little bit differently. That makes it harder to figure out what the zeros are. When you take something like that, and you change it to something like that. What do you call this version of it? Factor. So that's the first thing you have to do when you're trying to find the domain. If the bottom isn't factored, you need to factor it. We don't really need to worry about the top. Um, we will do things with the top for, for other stuff, but not for the bottom, not for the domain. Okay. So how is what's on the bottom going to factor? What's going to be my first term in each parenthesis? X and X. X and X. I've got a positive in the middle, and I've got a negative at the end, which means I need what for my positives and negatives inside? I need, a, I need one of each. That's the only way you're going to get a negative, is if you, if you put one of each. Now, since they are different, one's a positive, one's a negative, we might have to be careful what number we put where. Okay, what are two numbers that multiply to give me two? Yeah. What is it? Two and one. Two and one. Um, and we need to put the numbers in a certain spot. Where should we put the two? Well, if we put the two with the negative, then that's going to make the middle negative because that number is bigger than one. So we want to put the two with the positive. And if we check it, we get x squared minus 1x plus 2x. Minus 1 plus 2 is plus 1. Yep. Okay. So what are the two numbers here that we would not be allowed to use in the domain? We cannot use negative 2. We cannot use positive 1. So the domain is going to look exactly like what we wrote right there, except change the low number to negative 2 change the high number to positive 1. Is there any question how you would write the domain for that one? Yes? I know the question. So on the very, very top, obviously, before it's factored out. Um, on this one? Yeah. So if you know the number, can you just plug it in any place without factoring it? As long as you can find both numbers. Yeah, it might not always be as easy as like a 1 and a 2. I mean, it could be like a 13 and a 17. Okay. So the numbers could be harder to find, but if you factor it, then it'll make it easier to find. Yeah. So these are rational functions. Okay. They're not the simplest rational function. There's, there's a lot of, lot of terms in the numerator and the denominator. But if we do want to look at the simplest rational function, um, it's that one. 1 over x. And the name of that function is the reciprocal function. Okay. 
So the reciprocal function is the simplest rational function that you can have. It just has a 1 in the top, and it has just a single x in the bottom. And those are polynomials. 1 is a constant polynomial. x is a linear polynomial. So let's graph that on the calculator and just see um, what that kind of looks like. 1 divided by x. Now, it's going to have a part in it that gets pretty steep, so the calculator is going to have a hard time with it. Let me make it so you guys can see it a little bit better. Okay. So left to right, I think the calculator did a, did a pretty good job. But up and down, this part should keep going down, and this part should keep going up. Now, a couple things you want to notice. As you're drawing this, this graph never touches the x or the y axis. Okay. I'm not saying every <coughs> rational function doesn't do that, but, but this one doesn't. What's happening as, as it comes down and goes to the right, it's getting closer and closer and closer to the x-axis, but it's, it's never reaching it. And same thing as you head in quadrant one to the left. All of a sudden, as you get near the origin, it starts to curve up. And it goes almost straight up. That's why the calculator had a hard time drawing it. The calculator made it look like it just kind of stopped at like 5 or something. It doesn't, it doesn't stop there. Okay, these just keep going. But that's, that's what this rational function looks like. Um, now, does anybody remember what you call a line that you get closer and closer to, you kind of curve towards it, but you never end up reaching it. You know what begins with an A? Yeah? Asymptote. That's called an asymptote. Yep. It has a silent P in it. Yeah, it's called an asymptote. At least I think the P is silent. I don't, I, I don't hear asymptote. I just say asymptote. <coughs> So what's happening in that graph? This means as x approaches infinity, this means as x approaches negative infinity. Which way is infinity on the x-axis? Which direction? To the right. And which way is negative infinity? To the left. So this means, get that graph back up there. This means as you head to the right and as you head to the left, f of x is approaching 0. f of x is another name for what variable? It's another name for the y variable. Yep. So as you head to the right and as you head to the left, the y value is getting closer to 0, but it's never reaching it. The way we can tell that it never reaches it is if you go to your table and then plug in different numbers for x. If you do 5 for x, you get 0.2 for y. Pretty, it's pretty small. If you do 20 for x, you get 0.05. Okay, that, that's even closer to 0. If you do 100, now y is at 0.01. If you go all the way to 500 on the x-axis, look how small. Now it's at 0.002, but it's still not 0. In a minute, it's going to have to start doing scientific notation because it's going to run out of space on the screen. If I go all the way to 2,000, it says that. That's 0. 0.0005. That's just scientific notation. Okay. So it's, it's getting very close to 0. But no matter how big you make x, it will never it will never reach, right? That's point zero 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 one. Yeah. Right? It's never it's never gonna reach zero. And same thing if you check numbers in the negative direction. Let's do like negative a thousand. It's getting closer to zero, but this time it's getting closer to zero and it's a negative number versus getting closer to zero and it was a positive number. So one of them is coming down towards zero, the other one is coming up to zero. So whenever you get closer and closer to a number, as x gets bigger and bigger, but you never reach that number, 
That is called an asymptote, specifically a horizontal asymptote. Okay, so a couple things. When you write an equation of a horizontal line, it always has to start out with the letter y equals. That's how you write the equation of a, ver of a horizontal line. So to figure out what the horizontal asymptote should be, you look at your problem and look at what happens in the graph as the x value continues to get bigger and bigger in the positive direction or bigger and bigger in the negative direction. If you're getting closer to a number, that is your horizontal asymptote. Okay, so let's, let's try, um, well, let's actually look at a few pictures. These are examples of horizontal asymptotes. We usually draw them as a dotted line. And if you're saying, wait, I thought you said you never cross the horizontal asymptote. Well, it's not that you never cross it. It's that as you head to infinity, you're getting closer and closer to it. Okay? If you cross it early on when the x is like 1 or 2, that, that doesn't matter. It's like when x is like 1,000, are you getting closer and closer to it? Okay, so like in that one you would be, and so on the one on the left you would be as well. So any question on what, a, what an asymptote looks like? Okay, so now um, let's see if we can find the horizontal asymptote in this problem. Let's graph it and see what we've got. Okay, we've got 1 divided by x, and you do need parentheses because you don't want the plus 2 to be part of the fraction. So when you type it in, you want to type it in just like that. All right, let's do zoom 6. And as we had left and right, does it look like the graph is leveling out? Ricky, what do you think? Uh, Not what it's leveling out at. Does it just look like it's starting to get flatter? Not really. I don't think so. All right. Um, let me I zoom out a little bit more. Let's go like negative 20 to 20 on the x-axis. Okay, yeah. And remember, it's really steep in the middle, so it, it should be going up and down forever. But does it look like it's, it's leveling out? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now what we have to do is figure out what number it's leveling out at. So to figure that out, let x be a really big positive number or a really big negative number and see what happens. Can you just shut the door for me? Um, so go to second table. And I've already got some numbers in here from before. But as x gets bigger and bigger, what number does it look like y is getting closer to? 2. Yeah, it's getting closer and closer to 2. When x is 10,000, it's extremely close to 2. It's 2.0001. I don't know why it does that number normal, but when we had four decimal places and the other number, it did scientific notation. Just the way the calculator is programmed, I guess. Right. So now let's check the negative direction. At negative 1,000. We're at 1.9999, and then let's do like negative 5,000. We're at 1.9998. So in that direction, it's also getting closer to what number? Two. Two, yeah. So the horizontal asymptote in this problem is at two. And what letter did I say we always write by itself on the left when it's horizontal? Yep. What? Yep. It's going to be y equals. If you put x equals, that is wrong. I'm going to talk about x equals in a minute, but that's that's something else. Okay, so it's y equals two. Now, the other way you can look at this is just look at the problem without the picture. Focus on that box. As x gets bigger and bigger and bigger in this fraction, the bottom of the fraction is getting bigger. If you have a number in the bottom of a fraction that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, what does that do to your whole fraction? 
if the bottom is getting bigger? Make it, smaller. it makes the whole fraction smaller. And if the bottom is going to get so big, like let's say the bottom was a billion, one divided by a billion is extremely small. So this fraction is getting very, very, very small and getting close to what number? If it's getting smaller and smaller. Zero. It's getting very close to zero. If you take something that's extremely close to zero, like 0 0.0000002, and you add two to it, well, you basically just get two. So anything that has a fraction with a letter in the bottom is basically like it's going to disappear as x gets larger and larger. And all that you're left with is just the two. Okay, well, let's try that approach on, on this one. So I want to know the horizontal asymptote. And again, to think, think of the horizontal asymptote, pretend like the number in the bottom is going to grow forever. It's never going to stop growing. If the number in the bottom of the fraction is growing to infinity, the entire fraction is getting what? It's getting smaller. And it's going to get so small that it's going to get extremely close to what number? Yeah. It's going to get extremely close to 0, and then you're going to subtract 3 from it. So what are you basically left with if you take an extremely small number and subtract 3? You're left with negative 3. I mean, you might be left with like negative 2.9999999. It's, it's basically negative 3. So the horizontal asymptote is the number that you never reach. Any question on that one? Okay, so we, I already graphed that, kind of, I did that on the calculator minute ago, so we're not going to graph that again. All right. Now, I want to look at something else. Instead of looking at what's happening as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger, I want to look at what happens as x approaches the number you are not allowed to put in the bottom. Okay, that's a different question. What number are we not allowed to use in the bottom right there? We can't use zero. So, Type that back in. Go to my table. So if I type in 0, what's it going to tell me for y? Domain. Yeah, it's going to give me an error because I can't. That's not in the domain. 0, we just talked about that. It's, you cannot include it. So let's try something very close to 0. Let's try like 0.1 y value is 10. Let's go, what's, what's even closer to 0 than 0 0.1? 0 0.0. Now the y value is at 100. What, what's even closer than that? 0 0.001. Now the y value is at 1,000. As I start to get closer and closer to 0, what does it look like is happening to my y value? It's what? Yeah, it's just getting higher and higher. And the closer you get to zero, the higher and higher, now that's scientific notation, the higher and higher the y value is going to get. Okay. Now, there's two ways we can come at the number zero. Okay. Think of it on a number line. We were coming at it from the positive side. 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, 0 0.0001, 0 0.0001. We were getting smaller and smaller from the left. The other way that I can come at the number 0 is from the negative side. Okay? So that's coming and heading to the right. What would be a number that's very close to 0 heading to it from the left side to the right? Yeah, we could do like negative 0.1. And again, we're at negative 10. Let's do like negative 0 0.0001. We're at negative 10,000. So what does it look like is happening as you get closer to zero, coming at it from the left side? It's going, my y value is going down. And how far down does it look like my y value is going? Well, Chase, what do you think? 
I didn't get the question, so. So how far down does it look like my y value is going? An equal amount to how much you're changing the number the left by the x. Um, so I'm looking for like a, like a single word for what the y value is approaching. Or maybe two words. You might have to use two words. Well, what was the y value approaching from the point when we came at it from the right side? Positive infinity. Positive infinity. So negative infinity. This is negative infinity. Yep. And you can see that when you graph it because from the left side, all of a sudden your graph curves down. And on the right side, all of a sudden it curves up. If you have a graph that all of a sudden starts to curve up very sharply or down very sharply, you've just found a vertical asymptote. Okay, not horizontal, but vertical. So the way we would describe this part that I just circled is what's on the board right there. This means as you approach the number zero, but since you can come at zero from two ways, you've got to tell me which way. This means zero from the positive side. So you're starting in the positives, and you're heading towards your number. If you're coming at something from the negative side, that means the left. Right? So if, if there was your point, coming at that from the left side is like that. You're on the left side, and you're heading towards it. Coming at it from the positive side means you're on the right side and heading towards it. And you can do that with any number, whatever the number happens to be. This one's just zero. But any question on that idea of approaching a number from either side? Okay, you'll probably see that notation on the test. Okay, so the top one means as you come at zero from the right side, the y value goes up forever. As you come at zero from the left side, the y value goes down forever. And in this particular case, the number that you are not allowed to plug in is 0. And when you put the letter x in front of the number you can't use in the denominator, that is a vertical asymptote. So the nice thing about finding vertical asymptotes is if you know how to find the domain, you automatically know how to find vertical asymptotes. It's like the opposite of the domain. The domain is everything you can use. The vertical asymptotes are everything from the domain you can't use. Okay, so in general, the equation of a vertical asymptote is always x equals, and then you put a number. The number that you put right here is the number that would cause you to divide by zero. So that's why even in like, again, a multi-part question, if you have to like find the domain and then find the vertical asymptotes, mm -hmm. it's really the same things you have to do to do both those questions. You write your answer a little differently, but it still involves the same steps. And you don't have to use a graphing calculator with a table. To, uh, to do what we're doing. You could take the number 0 .01, 0 .001, and you could just plug it in by hand and do it out. It's just the table on the calculator can let me do lots of numbers really fast. That's why I use it. So if you had something like, let's just say 1 over x minus 6, what number are you not allowed to plug in the bottom there? Six. So if I graph that, I'm going to have a vertical asymptote at the number six. Let me show you. Uh, you do need parentheses, though, just like that. It's a watch. You're going to have a vertical line, imaginary, like just pretend it's there, and it's right at the number six. Now, let's try something like this. X. Let's graph x minus 3 divided by 
x minus 3. Now, is there a number there that would cause you to divide by 0? 3. So if you go to your calculator and you try to type in 3, you will get an error. Now, remember how a vertical asymptote normally looks. All of a sudden, the graph curves down and up very sharply. Let's see if, when I type this in and graph it, let's see if when x is 3, all of a sudden the graph curves up and down very sharply. So watch what happens as it gets close to 3. What does it look like happened when it got close to 3? Nothing. Nothing didn't look like anything happened at all. Now, watch what happens if I do that. Just change the top a little bit. Instead of 3, now it's 3.1. What number would cause you to divide by 0? Three. 3. Still 3. I didn't change that. But watch what happens when you graph it. As I get close to 3 this time, now I have a very obvious vertical asymptote. So why? What was the difference between having that be a 3 and a 3.1? It's, it's not a big change. Well, the problem with that one, the reason we didn't get a vertical asymptote, even though 3 caused us to divide by 0, is because the top and the bottom had what we call a common factor. It had an x minus 3 in the top and an x minus 3 in the bottom. If you have a common factor, you will not get a vertical asymptote. Let me write that down. In fact, I won't say you don't get a vertical asymptote. I'll just tell you what you do get. If you have a common factor, you get a hole in the graph. So the real way that that problem should have looked, if we were going to sketch it by, like by hand, let's just take this. What you have to do when you sketch this one is show me there's a hole in the graph by putting a circle right there. And there shouldn't be any blue in it. I just can't, I can't erase the blue. So it should basically look like this. That's how you draw a graph with a hole in it. And a hole in a graph will happen if you have a common factor in the top and the bottom. How would you know that? You have a factor. But if you don't have a common factor, then you will get a vertical asymptote. And the vertical asymptote is always at the number that would cause you to divide by 0, as long as that condition is met. Okay, Let's try this one. In, in that example, do the top and the bottom have a common factor? No. To have a common factor, you'd have to have an x minus 2 in the top. So because we do not have a common factor, what are we going to have in this graph? Oh, yeah. In general, because we, we do not have a common factor. Oh. If you have a common factor, you get a whole. We do not have a common we're going to get a vertical asymptote. Okay. Question on that? So if you have a common factor, you get a hole. We don't have a common factor. Okay. So we are not going to get a hole. All right. So we're going to get a vertical asymptote. And when you write the equation of a vertical asymptote, what letter always goes by itself on the left? If you put y, what kind of asymptote is that? That's horizontal. So 
So if it was like a multiple choice question, and one answer was x equals five and y equals five, and you picked the wrong one, it's, it's, it's just totally wrong. Vertical has to be x. Okay. And now, when would the denominator be zero in this problem? denominator would be zero when x is two. So that is the vertical asymptote. All right, let's try yeah, another one. Let's try this one. Okay. First of all, what number would cause you to divide by zero? Yep. Negative, Negative three. I'm not saying if it's an asymptote or a whole yet, we don't know. Let's look at the let's look at this this part of it. Is there a common factor in the top and the bottom there? No. no. To be a common factor, you would need x plus 3 in the top. You don't have that. So that means at negative 3, we are going to have a what? We don't have any common factors. If you do have a common factor, you get a whole. But we don't. So what are we going to get? We're getting a vertical asymptote. And what, what's the letter we always put on the left for a vertical asymptote? X. Yep, x. And where is the vertical asymptote in this one? Negative. Negative 3. Okay. What if I change this to minus 13? Where would the vertical asymptote be now? still be at negative 3. The vertical asymptotes are the numbers that make the denominator 0. By changing that to minus 13, I haven't changed anything here. This is what would change the vertical asymptote. This number out here does not. This number would change something else. What would this number change? Yep. Does that change like how, like how high up and down it is? How high up and down it goes, which is which asymptote? Uh, horizontal. That's the horizontal, yes. So we're going to talk about that in a second, but this is a vertical shift of down 13 units. Yep. This is a horizontal shift, um, three units to the uh, left. Yep. Okay. Let's let's actually let's talk about those transformations right now. Um, all right. So transformations. So we have four basic transformations. We have the shifting left and right, that's one. Shifting up and down, that's vertical. Stretching left and right, stretching up and down. So we just have to figure out where do you put a number in this type of problem to make those four things happen. So there's two ways you could see it written. You could either see something like C times 1 over BX plus or minus A plus or minus D. And the A, the B, the C, and the D all do one of the things that I just said. Let me just make this very clear that it's right in the middle. Or you could see something like C over and then the same thing. Those are the same thing. The only difference with the second one is they took the C that was in front and they did C times 1 and just put the whole answer in the top. It's kind of like writing something like this. That's a bad example. Let's do like 5 times 1 over 6, or 5 sixths. One way you're kind of writing it separate, the other way you're multiplying it together. But it's, just, it's the same thing. OK, so let's start with the A. The A, that is a horizontal shift. Now remember, when we studied horizontal shifts before, they're backwards. So plus a number is going to move you which way? Left. And minus a number? Right. To the right. Okay. B is still inside the denominator. So when I talk about being inside the denominator, I'm talking about what I just circled. 
So because it's inside, it's still horizontal, but now it's multiplication. Multiplication is not a shift. Multiplication is a stretch. stretch. Yes. So that's a horizontal stretch. And just as an example, so if you had a value where b is 2, let's just do kind of a simple one. There's a couple ways we can write this down. Because it's horizontal, it's backwards. So this is horizontal stretch by, even though this number is a 2, you write it as 1 over 2. We say horizontal stretch by 1 half. If you had something like 1 over, let's say, 1 third x, you might think, oh, 1 third is a small number. Uh, wait a minute, did I do that? Horizontal stretch? Yeah, yes, that's right, yeah. So horizontal stretch by 1 half, and this would be horizontal stretch by 3. It's just horizontal is always, always backwards. That's the only one that's it's just kind of weird. So a big number actually causes your graph to compress. A really small number, like one third, actually causes your graph to stretch out three times as much. Does that make sense? It's the opposite. So if you put a number in like 10, that's a really big number, 10 is actually going to make your graph one tenth as big. All right, C. Okay, now we're on the outside. This is multiplying by a number on the outside. What do you think C is going to be? Because it's multiplying, like B, but now it's on the outside. Uh, so it's going to be written like either A or B, but it's going to be on the outside instead of the inside. Yeah? The horizontal shrink. Yeah, or stretch or shrink. It could be could be either one. But we already have horizontal, so this one's the this is the vertical. So this is the vertical stretch. And it's not backwards. So if you had like four times one over x, that's a vertical stretch by four. And then if you had something like one, like a one-third in front, so if you have a fraction in front, that's a vertical stretch by one-third. So a bigger number stretches it bigger, a smaller number shrinks it smaller. That it works the way you would expect. Plus you. Thank you. Okay, and lastly, D. D is adding and subtracting like A, but it's on the outside. So what kind of transformation do you think D is? That's your vertical shift. And a positive would move your graph which way? What kind of shift is it again? Vertical. So positive would move it oh. up. And negative? Down. Down. Vertical, it's always, you just use common sense. You don't have to reverse it. Okay. So that's what the A, the B, and the C do. Now, if the B or the C was a negative, that causes something else to happen. What does a negative cause your graph to do? Flip. Flip. If B is negative, let's so add this right here. B is negative, that's a horizontal flip or horizontal reflection. If C is negative, C is in the vertical part, so what kind of reflection do you think that would be if C is negative? Vertical. Yeah, vertical. C is negative, 
it's a vertical reflection. Some people, when you say vertical reflection, they also say reflect over the x-axis. That, that's a vertical. And horizontal reflection is reflecting left to right over the y-axis. Okay. So any question on um, what each letter does? That's, that's important for, for this one. Okay, so let's um, see if we can describe oh, yeah. the um, asymptotes here and the transformations, uh, and then we'll do our, our last one. Now, look at what's written in green. Let me put up what I had again in black, and compare that to those two. Does what I have written in green look like what I just circled in black? Specifically looking at like the numerator. What, what were my, look at what's circled in black. What's in the numerator for the one on the left? A one. Is there a one in the top there? No. Okay, what's in the numerator that's on the right? A C, just a single number. Is there a single number in the top there? No. no then we need to fix that so it's written like that. Until we have that looking like that, none of this information that I just gave you is gonna help. So let's practice something with a number first and then we'll do that one. Um, let's say that I wanted to do, uh, let's say 14 and I wanna divide by three. When I divide that, I'm going to get a quotient, and I'm going to get a remainder. What's the quotient when you divide 14 by 3? 4. Four. It goes in 4 times, but it doesn't go in evenly. What's left over? 2. two. So when you do long division, the way that you write your answer is quotient plus remainder over divisor. That's just like a you know thing from third or fourth grade when you do long division. It's quotient plus remainder over divisor. So my quotient was four. What was my remainder? Two. Two. And what was my divisor? Four. Three. three. So when you divide 14 by three, the answer is four plus two thirds, or a lot of times you see that as a mixed number. Four and two thirds. But what's important here is just that concept, because that's what we're going to have to use to do what we're about to do. Does everyone understand why 14 divided by 3 is 4 and 2 thirds? Quotient plus remainder over divisor. So what we need here is a quotient. How do you get a quotient? You do long division. And that's what we did um, last week. That was section 3.3. .3. So now let's. Let's divide that, and it's going to turn what's in green into more like something that's in black. And then we'll be able to do what they want us to do. Okay, so x minus 5 divided into 2x minus 13. Okay, it's not going to be a big long division problem because the top and the bottom are relatively short formulas. Okay, so the first step is 2x divided by 1x. What's 2x divided by 1x? Um, 2x divided by 1x is 2. x is canceled. So 2. And now multiply it back out. What's 2 times x? 2x. What's 2 times negative 5? Negative 10. And when we're doing long division, what do we do with these columns? Subtract. What's 2x minus 2x? Cancels. What about negative 13 minus minus 10? Negative 3. So now um, we're done. What's my quotient there? 2. And what's my remainder? Negative 3. So now 
We're going to write this down exactly like that. Quotient plus remainder over original divisor. This is exactly the same thing as this. It's just a different way of writing it. And that's what we are going to do right now. So let's just go up here. So my quotient was 2. Now normally it's plus my remainder over my divisor, but my remainder is a negative. So I'm going to make that a negative. And what was my divisor? X minus 5. Now if that still looks a little weird, you can think of it this way. That I think is going to match more closely to what we wrote down. Instead of having the plus 2 in the front, you can move the plus 2 to the end. Now, look at what we have over here. Which one does that look similar to? Um, the one on the left or the one on the right? Yeah, it's exactly the one on the right. You just have to identify what, what each number is doing. Okay. Um, so let's start with our first transformation. I put it in alphabetical order, horizontal shift. Um, is there a number in the A spot in that problem? Yep, what number is there? Negative. Negative five, and you could have seen that from the original problem. The other ones you couldn't see as easy. This one you could. So negative five, and that's going to do what to my graph? Shift right. Yep, so shift right five. Okay. Look in the B spot. Um, is there a number in front of B, or in front of the X? No, it's just a 1. So in this case, there's, there's nothing I need to deal with in front of the x. Okay, so go to the next thing. Um, go to c. Is there a number in the spot that represents c? There's a, there's a number there, and what number is right there? Just a 3. Okay, we'll come back to that in a second. And that 3 is going to be a vertical stretch by a factor of, well, this one was a 4, that one's a 3. So I'll just write 3. So vertical stretch by a factor of 3. Now, there's also something else going on in front of that fraction. What else is in front of it? A negative, and that's what we talked about right here. That negative is going to cause my graph to do what? Reflect, yeah. It's going to reflect vertically, or you can say reflect over the x-axis. Either way. So a vertical reflection is reflection over x-axis. Um, there is one more number we got to look at. What's the last number that is going to do something here? Plus two. plus 2. And that's a plus 2 in the spot that's D. So what's that going to do? Up yep, it's going to shift up 2. So that describes all the transformations. Okay, so that's this part. Describe how we can obtain the graph. Uh, now they want to just know the two asymptotes. That's kind of what, what we did before in the earlier questions. Um, you can look, I would say, to do the horizontal asymptote, it's probably easier to look at, at this one. Actually, it's easier to just use the one that's in black for both. Think about what's going to happen here as x gets bigger and bigger. The bottom of that gets bigger and bigger. Minusing 5 from it, that doesn't, even, that doesn't do anything. Like if x is 200 billion, I mean, what's the difference between 200 billion and 200 billion minus 5? There's not really much of a difference. So what's going to happen to this entire fraction as the bottom continues to get bigger and bigger? Yeah? It's going to get very small because the bottom is going to get very big. And when it gets very small, it's going to get close to what number? Zero. Yeah, very, very close to zero. 
So that part basically has no importance at all as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger because it, it shrinks to nothing. What's the only thing you're left with if that part disappears? Two, and that's your horizontal asymptote. And since it's horizontal, um, which way do I write that? Or which letter do I use to write that? Yeah, yep. So horizontal asymptote. Y equals two. Vertical asymptote is the number that would cause you to divide by zero. Um, what number would cause you to divide by zero? Yeah. Five. Is there a common factor in the top and the bottom? No. I'd have to have an x minus five in the top for that. So vertical asymptote, x equals five. And that's everything they wanted to know. Horizontal and vertical asymptotes. And the transformations. Any uh, questions on that? Okay, so that's uh, the first part of rational functions. Um, there's one thing left. I think what we'll do is we'll we're going to do the last thing tomorrow. So since we're splitting the next section in half each day, it's going to be um, shorter anyway. So we'll we'll finish that tomorrow. And that's um, the mixture problem. So the only thing in the homework that was the mixture problem is that one. So you don't, you don't have to do number 48, but if you want to write it down, you can. That'll be the first problem in tomorrow's homework. Okay, so tonight, it's just page 222, um, 3 through 7, 11 to 21 odds, and then 23, 31, 37, and 38. Don't, don't worry about 48 for tonight's homework.